Welcome to today's webinar titled Achieving Interoperability Between Resources Involved in Text and Data Mining at the Level of Metadata. This webinar is offered by the Open Minted Project on Text and Data Mining of Scholarly Publications in Europe. The presenter today is Penny Lapropoulou, who is working on the Open Minted Project at the Athena Research Center in Athens, Greece. This webinar is recorded and will be made publicly available at a later time. By participating in the webinar, you agree to the recording and publishing of the recording, including everything you contribute to the discussion. Please ensure that your microphones are muted during the presentation and whenever you're not speaking. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and discussion. And now over for Penny to, uh, for the presentation. Thank you all for joining the webinar and uh... I welcome you also to this. Um, so, in this first webinar, uh, first of all, an organizational point, uh, we will have the presentation first, and I would like to ask you to keep your comments uh, and questions for after the presentation during the discussion session. Uh, so, uh, in this webinar, we will discuss the Open Minted Share Metadata Schema and discuss how it has been conceived and designed in order to serve as a facilitator for the project, providing the interoperability bridge between the various resource types involved in text and data mining, just as the title says. So, a brief overview of the outline of the presentation. First, I will try to set up the framework in which this endeavor is set. Uh, point to the problem and the strategies we have adopted to tackle it. Um, the strategies will be presented through the Open Minted Share Schema. We will give a short presentation of its contents, the principles and some examples, and we will discuss specific principles and say how they have been implemented, how they have influenced the schema itself and finish with the current status of the schema and the way it is currently being used in open-minded to populate the registry of the platform with uh, metadata and resources. So first let's start with the framework. As uh, Richard pointed in the beginning, um, Open Minted, uh, this is set in the uh, Open Minted project which sets out to create an open service-oriented infrastructure for text and data mining of scientific and scholarly content. In this infrastructure, researchers can collaboratively create, discover, share and reuse knowledge from a wide range of text-based scientific related resources in a seamless way. And um, first of all, although I know that most of you will be probably uh, familiar with the concepts of this webinar, I would like to put some definitions so that we have uh, a common ground on uh, the concepts of the webinar for our discussion. And the key concepts are the ones that I have put in uh, light blue color, uh, starting so with text and data mining. For some reason, the click doesn't work very well, so sorry. For text and data mining, uh, this is the discovery by computer of new, previously unknown information by automatically extracting and relating information from different resources to reveal otherwise hidden meanings. Uh, we find it in the literature with other terms as well, such as content mining, research analytics, text analytics, etc. But the key point here is that we want to discover information, extract information from various resources. And to do this, we need to have interoperable resources, interoperability being defined as relating to systems, from the American Heritage Dictionary, relating to systems, especially of computers or telecommunications, that are capable of working together without being specially configured to do so. Key terms for this definition uh, in our project is are the words working together, collaboration, without prior configuration. 
the resources that we're dealing with in Open Minded are what we call language resources, and this encompass both data sets, mainly textual, though usually they can be also multimodal or multimedia. We're dealing with lexical data, grammars, language and machine learning models, and we're also looking at tools, technologies, web services used for their processing. And these language resources come to Open Minded together with their descriptions in uh, the form of formal metadata, which contain descriptive, contextual, and provenance assertions about the properties of a digital object. This is taken from the RDA Research Data Alliance core terms, and a digital object is definitely one of the, is the uh, and a language resource in Open Minded is definitely a digital object. It has a digital form. So, what are the language resolve, uh, the language involved in text and data mining? These are content resources and software resources. And uh, we divide with uh, content resources into the resources to be mined, uh, the resources from which we will extract information, and, and in open-minded, as we said before, these are mainly uh, scientific and scholarly publications. But also, we need to look at ancillary reference resources, which includes type systems, linguistic tag sets, terminological lexica, and ontologies, which are used uh, to annotate the mind resources. Machine learning models that are usually used together with components to, uh, when they're operating, uh, when they're applied on the machine resources, on the on the man, mind resources, or even reference corpora and training corpora that are used to evaluate or improve the algorithms. Software resources or components, as we call them, refer to the processing software. They come in the form of downloadable and locally executable tools. Uh, we would like to have them, especially in open-minded, or, or, uh, distributed as web services uh, that run over the internet. And uh, components can be put together uh, to compose workflows, uh, which are also or can also uh, operate as uh, downloadable. Uh, tools or as web services over the net, internet. So what about metadata? Why are their descriptions of these resources important for the TDM processes and for interoperability? Uh, the metadata are used in Open Minded first in the registry service. The registry service is targeting end users, researchers that will use the TDM uh, uh, the TDM uh, processing software, but also TDM experts, experts that are developing TDM uh, solutions. They will use them to register content and software components, and they will also use them uh, during, uh, uh, in a second uh, stage to search and find content and software components that can process this content. Metadata are also used in the workflow service, which is mainly targeting TDM service developers. This is where they will go to search and find software components and ancillary resources that can be combined together in order to compose workflows. These need to be, or they need to be able to be made compatible. Hence, they need to be interoperable in some way. So what we need is to, for metadata, is to document properties that users use in their queries to discover the resources, but also we need to document properties that will support the automatic uh, discovery of compatibility between software components, between them, uh, but also between the content and the software components. We need, that is, to enhance discoverability of resources and discoverability of interoperability fi features. So where do metadata come from in open-minded? Where do language resources come from in open-minded? 
the way this project has been perceived is that, that it's a piece of an ecosystem of e infrastructures. It is not one more registry of content and services, but it is, um, it, me it is meant to serve mainly as a TDM facilitator. So the registry is meant, to, uh, the aims to register only resources that are useful for TDM. And this can come from a variety of sources. So for content resources to be mined, scholarly publications, we expect to get input from big aggregators of such content, such as OpenAir and Core. OpenAir is a big aggregator for uh, scholarly publications, open access uh, scholarly publications at the EU level. Core does the same thing for the UK mainly. We also do expect to get some input from publishers through a, a content connector that is going to be uh, uh, implemented in open-minded from traditional publishers, mainly of open access material first, because open-minded focuses first on open access. For ancillary content resources such as lexical ontologies, machine learning models, corpora, etc., we expect to get input uh, from various repositories too, such as MetaShare, which is a repository that hosts resources in tech intended for language technology development and consumption, but also from discipline portals uh, where, for instance, researchers of biomedicine or um, life sciences will usually put their ontologies or the terminologies they're using. Uh, MetaShare will also provide us with metadata and resources for software components, and we expect to get also input for this from component collections and Maven Docker repositories and uh, similar repositories or collections. Uh, from this, we also expect to get information on ancillary resources. We need to have from them the descriptions of their type systems, tag sets, machine learning models that come together with these components or that component developers have uh, created to, uh, for the operation of their tools or for their components. So, what we need to do is to put together these metadata descriptions and ensure that they can be exploited to bring up interoperability properties per language resource type, but also across language resource types. And what is the problem? As we have seen from the previous slide, we have a variety of sources, which means a variety of metadata schemas that have already been used to describe these resources. Uh, moreover, they come from various scientific communities, and as we all know, each scientific community has its own way of conceptualizing the world and the object of their study. So we have problems with semantics, and we need to establish mappings and semantic links between these various metadata schemas so that they can speak together in the shared world of open-minded. That is, we need to define a common core vocabulary for the description of the resource properties. We need to know, for instance, that we use the same term for uh, representing the language of the contents of a publication or a corpus, and we also need to use the same term for uh, representing uh, the input that a software component may take. We need to know that this can be matched together. Or, for instance, we want to use the same term for the domain, subject, or topic that a publication or corpus talks about, is about, but also use the same term when describing an ontology, a lexicon that can be used to annotate it, so that they can be automatically matched. And we know that we can use them together. But defining such a common vocabulary is not as easy. How can we select the common denominator from all the schemas? What happens with gaps that we find the original metadata records for properties that we consider important for text and data mining? What happens in the reverse 
process. When we get some uh, metadata records that are very rich in information and we want to uh, convert them, to map them to a metadata schema that uh, is uh, poorer in information. What about mismatches between metadata elements and values? How are these to be handled? All these are questions that anyone that has been involved in metadata modeling has come across these questions. So in to answer these questions, we have um, adopted certain principles, certain strategies in the design of the metadata schema, of the OMTG share schema. I'll go through them very quickly and then we'll analyze them looking at uh, more closely at the schema itself. First, we want to cover the needs of resource discoverability and TDM processing. Although this has been repeated, it doesn't hurt to repeat it more and more. <laughs> Second, we need to cover documentation needs for all resource types involved in TDM. We want to be flexible enough to support varying degrees of documentation completeness. And we want to organize the schema elements uh, in such a way that it is user friendly and accommodate common versus particular features of resources. We want to reuse what is available out there, but also create and recommend new elements and values. We want to standardize, normalize the user input, but also allow the user to input pretext wherever this is needed. And we need, want to document the processing procedure and outputs uh, so that the uh, OMTD share resources in the end have carry on all the information that is required for the next processing step. So for the first principle in order to determine the needs, the requirements of resource descriptions, we have relied on work done and documented in two open-minded deliverables. The one uh, regards interoperability requirements and it has looked into the scenarios and uh, the four use cases that are targeted by Open Minted uh, in the areas of scholarly communication, life sciences, agriculture and biodiversity, and social sciences. Uh, the other deliberable is the interoperability landscape in a report. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, records uh, various metadata schemas and other resources that are relevant to interoperability. From this, we have focused on uh, the metadata schemas that were more uh, closer, to, closer to what we intend to do. And this, for instance, include open air, core and Rio guidelines and cross-ref for publications, MetaShare, DataSite, DKIT, and uh, for uh, software components and data sets, uh, CMDI relevant metadata profiles also. This come from the Clarin infrastructure. Okay, um, one point here, the deliverables will all be made publicly available very soon through the open-minded uh, uh, site. So for the second principle, what are the resources that we want to cover in OMTD share in open-minded? Um, first of all, there are the core entities, the resources that we really want to describe, the software components and the corpora, the data sets that we are going to mine, the lexical conceptual resources, the ancillary resources that are used for the operation of the components. We also want to describe still the uh, some satellite entities such as the actors, persons and organizations that are also involved uh, in the life cycle of a resource like persons and organizations that have created publications or corpora or components, the projects that have funded the resource, the creation of the resource or where the resource has been used. So all these take some specific kinds of metadata elements, but our main entities are the ones that I have here in this schema in blue color. Uh, for the satellite entities, we try to get information from other sources, and these are the entities that I have in yellow. This is only um, part of the uh, 
ontology of open-minded. There are more resources there, but this is just to show what we're talking about. Focusing more on the resources, on the core resources of the OMTD share schema, there are five basic resource types. Corpora, which includes data sets of text documents and software components, lexical conceptual resources where we have also uh, subsumed annotation resources uh, such as uh, ontologies but also type systems and tag sets, linguistic tag sets. Language descriptions which mainly covers grammars and machine learning models. Uh, I would like here to say that model could also be considered as a subtype of language description, but we decided to keep it distinct uh, because it has a lot of properties that differentiate it from grammars. And at this point, it was also considered better to keep them apart as it would enhance the discoverability of models. Uh, Publications are a um, particular resource type in OMTD. Researchers will not go into an open-minded to read one by one the publications. They will only look at them as sets, as a corpus. This is why we have this line uh, which links together corpus and publications. They will ask, they will try to select publications based on specific criteria. To say, for instance, I want um, corpus of English articles in the biomedicine area in order to run specific DDM services on them. So the corpus building process from publication is going to be supported by the Open Minted Registry and, of course, the schema. Uh, a few sample metadata records so that we know what we're talking about. These are simplified records for the presentation. Uh, it's metadata record for a resource, for instance, in this case, for a corpus, will include a section for the metadata, which um, includes information about the identifier of the metadata record, the metadata creation date, where it has been collected from. In this case, they have the, they have, uh, the corpus has been built with publications from OpenAir and Core. And a part which includes information about the resource itself, the corpus. As you can see, there will be a different identifier for the resource and the, for the metadata record, simply because metadata records on their own have uh, an identity. They can change over uh, time. Uh, they can change uh, in uh, different repositories. So it's best that we they also have some persistent identifier, unique persistent identifier attached to them. Uh, the corpus will have um, a resource name, a title, a short description, preferably in English. Uh, we can have information about the contact person, optional information like who has created the corpus, license information, the license under which this corpus can be accessed. We need to have information about uh, the type and the subtype of the resource, that it is a corpus and it's a raw corpus, it has not been annotated yet information about language, uh, text format. For instance, in this case, this corpus uh, has multiple MIME types. It, uh, it contains publications in plain text, but also as PDF files, uh, the character encoded and the size. An example also for a component. Again, a very simplified record. Uh, we have information, a part again for the metadata and a part for the component itself. The name, which is a title, uh, it could have a short name. Again, uh, a small description about the tool, contact person. Version is very important for components, so we recommend its uh, addition. Who has created it? Um, a type, a classification type for its component, how it can be accessed. This one is going to be um, is going to be fired as a web service. Where it can be accessed from, 
the license again for accessing the component and most important for the component we need to have the specifications for the input content resource it may take and the output it will produce. Uh, this tool which is a tiger will take as input either a corpus, a set of files or a single document which is in Greek, has to be encoded in Unicode and it has to be in plain text and it will produce the output in an XML format which is according to the Access standard and it's according to the Access standard as it has been implemented inside the organization. It will be annotated at below part of speech tag, uh, tagging level according to the tag set that the ILSP post tag set that has been implemented by the organization. And we can also include information about the dependencies of these components, what language resources it needs to, uh, uh, to, uh, to work with in order to uh, operate. Uh, the type system that it uses and the tag set. This here I have just put um, a resource name. It could also be an identifier that links them to the uh, to the resource we're talking about. And this here we only put I have only put the uh, language resource dependencies, software dependencies such as Java libraries, etc. That it uses are described elsewhere. So, as I said before, uh, these metadata records are quite rich in information and uh, we could end up with uh, huge metadata records that uh, are difficult to read, but also the most important thing is that resource providers are very reluctant to describe their resources. And if we ask them to describe everything, they will simply not describe anything at all. So, we try to find a balance between what users want, which is detailed formal information, and what providers want to do, which is minimal descriptions. And the way to do that is that we have three levels of optionality. First, we have the ob obligatory elements, and to decide which ones are obligatory, we, have, uh, we are basing our criteria on the intended purposes that is for discovering resources and for triggering operations between content and web services. We need to have at least those elements that can help them, help us in this. Uh, ease of documentation, okay, this is taken into consideration, but it's not the primary criteria. So, for instance, for scholarly publications, we want to have the language because this will tell us which tools we can use, which components, software components we can use for the processing. Title and author are not important, as I said before. They're not something that will help us uh, in TDM. Format, yes. Subject, yes. Yet subject is something that not, we don't easily find in, uh, in a scholarly publication. We usually have keywords, but okay, we need to find a balance between the two. We have recommended elements which are the features that can help the user in using the, the, the resource or future uses of the resource or things that users find useful but providers have not yet standardized. So for instance, help files are very important for software components because they will tell you how to use uh, uh, the tool but you don't always find them. Attribution citation papers are coming more and more into the um, landscape. Attribution for legal reasons, citation for research ethics, people that have created something, a tool, a tag set, a lexicon, want to be cited and they want to be attributed in a specific way. We have optional elements with all the rest of all remaining information related to the life cycle of a resource. So we have specific metadata elements where uh, providers can record funding information and just as a point here, this is again coming more and more uh, required on the user uh, level. Uh, funding agencies 
are becoming more and more interested in and they want to record it so maybe at a later point later point funding information might be promoted to the recommended level not yet projects where the resources have been used and created outputs people want to know where the resources they have developed have been used so that they can see how they can be evaluated better, for instance. Another way of uh, making easier for the users to understand the information in rich metadata records is to organize the schema into sets of semantically coherent elements. And uh, this is something that comes from the CMDI, the Client Metadata Infrastructure, but also from MetaShare, where we have sets of elements that are common to all types of resources, and these are usually uh, administrative information, like identification licensings, but also uh, sets of elements that are different per resource type, and these are usual te usually technical features that are uh, more compatible with specific resource types. Uh, schema to show um, an image to show what we mean by elements and sets of elements. Its resource is described through sets of elements and this is what is put into blue. So for instance a resource will contain information about identification, distribution, how it's distributed and technical features. Uh, specific elements can be uh, put together to create a set of elements. So, for instance, in the case of licensing, we have an element that talks about the license or the right statement. We have an element specific to the attribution text. We have elements which link uh, to another entity, such as the rights holders, who can be a person or an organization. Format is an element, for instance, that comes under the technical features set of elements. Okay, so what are the common obligatory elements for all the resources, all resource types? As I said before, um, these are mainly administrative, so we have identification and provenance formation of the metadata record which includes the obligatory elements metadata record identifier and metadata creation date. If uh, the metadata record doesn't have an identifier this will be uh, assigned by Open Minted. The identification of the resource itself, it will again have an identifier. If it already has an identifier from uh, previous sources, we would like this to be referred to with, together with the identification scheme. It comes with a DOI identifier, a handle identifier, or an internal organization identifier, for instance. Um, a title, a name for the resource, which has to be user, uh, preferably something that uh, human beings can understand, and a small description, something that tells us what this uh, this resource is about. Uh, the description can be multilingual, although, okay, for obvious reason, English should be there, but there are no guarantees that it will be there. We also think that distribution and licensing access conditions must be uh, uh, present in the metadata. Uh, and this includes the form uh, with which uh, uh, the form with which the resource can be accessed is it distributed, whether it's a source or an executable code, whether it's a downloadable text, whether it's a lexicon that can be accessed only through an interface. And of course, the license itself or the right statement, and by right statement I mean things like open access, closed access, restricted access that are still um, used in, uh, in uh, uh, the description of resources. Uh, we would like to also have the license text or a URL uh, which includes the license text uh, for the access. 
we need to have, we ask for a contact information. This can come either as an email of a person or a general email of an organization and a landing page for the resource, not for the organization. We need something which is about the resource. And of course, all resources have a resource type, whether it's a corpus, a component, and depending on the resource type, we could have subtypes as well, some classification. So, looking at each resource type, the important elements, which are the obligatory and recommended ones, and I'll only go through some of them in this presentation, are the following. For publications, we need to have an abstract or a full text. We don't want bibliographic metadata records. If we don't have the abstract, if we don't have the full text, or at least the abstract, we cannot perform any TDM, as simple as that. Okay, title can be there for identification reasons, but it's not that important, as I said before. Language, text format, character encoding, these are important because they will tell us whether these publications can be processed by the software components. Uh, subject classification, if it's there, it's very useful because it can help uh, the users to create uh, their own data sets where they will perform TDM. If they don't have the subject classification, the journal name can serve, or the publisher or the repository where these publications have come, can serve as an indicator of the research area. If it's something coming from the journal of, uh, uh, of uh, biomedicine, or if it comes from PubMed, you know that this is something that has to do with medical texts, and you can use it for your TDM. Corpora, these are, as I said before, uh, this can be built from publications, and this is what is going to be input into the software components in open-minded. So language, format, character encoding, and classification, as said before, these are important, and together with size, they can be computed automatically if, if they exist in the publications. They can, the, the metadata information can be passed on to the corpus level from the publication level. Software components. Uh, we want to have the specifications of the input content resource and what they produce as output. Language. If they're language dependent, if they're language independent, this doesn't have to be there. Format. What types of uh, uh, documents or corpora they can handle, character encoding. If they are uh, components that um, take as input an annotated resource, we need to know at which annotation level the, the input resource has to be, uh, which types are annotated, what tags are annotated, or what annotation resource has been tagged there, whether, it come, whether it's a named entity, uh, sorry, whether it's a past corpus which is uh, uses the pantry bank tags, for instance. The dependencies. Again, I'm talking about resource, language resource dependencies. Uh, I am a tagger that I add uh, part of speech tags or named entity tags, and this is the tag set that I'm using or I'm using uh, the, any kind of ontology which is in a certain format, in RDF JSON, for instance. Machine learning models, again, we need to know if they have been trained on a specific language, uh, used in a specific typeset or a specific typeset we would like to have some information about the algorithm that has been used so that we know what features these models have. The type systems that components use are themselves entities, sorry, resources that are being described separately. They're not just a name uh, in the dependencies. They're distinct resources and they're described on their own so that 
other TDM developers can have full access to the types uh, that are recorded in there and see if they can reuse the same type system or component. Most important, we want to have the links, the relationships between components and models or components and type systems. This component can be compatible with this model uh, or with this type system. Ontologies, as I said before, uh, that come from various disciplines and that can be combined with components for the annotation. can be a, a, an ontology of uh, proteins or an ontology of uh, uh, animal species, etc. So we need to know the language, the format, in order to know whether it can be combined with a specific component. Uh, uh, sorry, character encoding or classification. As I said before, these all need to be combined together through these uh, hooks, these metadata elements that serve as hooks for knowing which resources are compatible with uh, what other resources. So as I said before, we need to have relations between resources. Just to say here that in some cases the resources are uh, put inside the metadata record when these come from information that the resource provider themselves makes. So for instance, uh, between publication, the author, this is something that can go into the metadata record of the publication. But sometimes we also want to have them separately. So for instance, uh, a component uh, may be compatible with a machine learning model that someone else has created. Not the, uh, the developers of the component, the model are not the same. So we want to have this externally so that both, both developers can input this information at different uh, points of time. Um, some questions that we had also to, about, the, um, about deciding uh, if an element should or should not be made obligatory or should there be some restrictions on optionality and uh, one of the criteria that we have used for this was the uniformity of metadata records across sources. Um, if a metadata record comes from uh, uh, come as an XML record, it can be validated by XSD, so you, we have some restrictions there from the XSD that uh, we could, circ we could um, circumvent if, we were use if we're using uh, the registry editor. Uh, this is something that can be programmed, it's uh, up to us to create, and we could say, for instance, that if um, uh, if a, um, if a publication comes with uh, a license, it has to have a proper name and it has to have a version. Uh, and uh, for instance, for Creative Commons, the version can must be 4.0. This is something that cannot be enforced in the XSD. So sometimes we had to step back and uh, not enforce restrictions uh, for the sake of uniformity, as I said before. Okay, one of the most important principles that we have used for our um, schema in order to care for interoperability is the reuse. It's important to reuse things rather than reinvent the wheel, especially when the material comes from accredited sources or when it is widespread. So we try to recommend and uh, adopt standards and pe best practices and complement them where possible uh, where, and only complement them, sorry, when necessary. The first thing we do is that we recommend a link to authority list for properties. So for instance, for the format, we recommend the use of the analyst of media types. 
Still, this is not sufficient because saying, for instance, that um, something um, a, a resource comes as an XML file is not sufficient. We need to know also the standards that have been used. For instance, it could be um, the in uh, the encoded uh, TI encoded file. It could be a YACH article. Uh, it could be an access corpus. So we need some extension to format, and this has to be standardized in some way as well. For language, okay, okay, you want to use one and only. Um, standard and there we have to decide between the various versions of standards that exist uh, and although the most the one that seems to be the most widespread right now is ISO 639.3 we decided to adopt the IETF BCB 47 which is a W3C recommendation because it serves we believe our purpose is better as it combines uh, information uh, on it allows the representation of not only of language but also the region, the script, and the variant for its language. So we can say, for instance, this is a corpus of English as spoken in UK versus English as spoken in the US. For subject classification, okay, you want to point to authority lists. There's too many authority lists out there. DDC, Dewey Decimal Classification, Library of Congress, Eurovoc, discipline-specific lists. Uh, we don't want to impose to enforce only one scheme. We recommend our providers to use one of them, and we ask for a reference to it. So, for instance, someone can say that this is a corpus which is classified as according to DDC, and according to DDC, it has the subject 313. On the other hand, we want to create elements and values where we have attested gaps or when we consider this best for open minded purposes. For instance, for the subclassification of components, we didn't find anything that we could reuse, so we have drawn our own. Uh, ontology of component classification. First, we have um, uh, looked mainly into the TDM components right now and the way these are uh, these are better described for TDM developers. In the next version, we also want to see how these could be better described, better uh, represented for end users, for uh, uh, for researchers of specific disciplines. Uh, for the classification of lexical conceptual resources, also we have our own ontology, which is more general. Well, we also have a set of annotation elements and values, which we have created, which is going to be included in the auto output resources of the processing software automatically by the plot pool. For these new elements and values, and in general for the metadata schemas, we are working towards providing links to elements in other metadata, in other popular metadata schemas, so that we can speak among each other. We have also decided to adopt entire metadata schemas and registries, mainly for satellite entities, as I said before. For, so, for instance, we do not want to create a new metadata schema for repositories and registries. If someone wants to uh, to uh, put information, uh, put publications into open-minded, they will do that through open air or through core, and they will be asked to register their own repository in the open door, or the RE3 data, or if it's a journal in uh, the directory of open access journals, for instance, if it's open access. For persons and organization, again, we rely, to, we rely on other infrastructures that provide information about person organizations, ORCID and Scopus, for instance, for persons or ISN and FUNDREF organizations. But because they are important, set, important for MetaShare and we want some, uh, sorry, for OMTD Share, and we want some specific information about them. 
uh, uh, for instance, for contact persons, we need to have an email. We also have our own minimal set of metadata elements for these satellite entities. And uh, this is uh, a principle that it goes also very, the reuse principle goes also very uh, close with the standardization, normalization principle, which is also very important for uh, achieving interoperability. It helps in establishing links across different uh, metadata. So, uh, standardization, normalization of satellite entities, as I said before, will be achieved by the identifier, the persistent identifier, uh, which preferably comes from an authority so source with reference to it. We would rather have uh, uh, recommend specific authority lists for uh, specific resources, but this cannot be enforced yet. So preferably DOI for publications, if they don't have they, we could get handle uh, attributes or uh, URL uh, identifiers as long as uh, the identifier comes also with the reference to the identifier scheme to the authority that has provided it. Uh, if the resource or the entity doesn't have yet an identifier, at least we want to have some descriptive elements, the title of the resource or the full name of a person or an organization. We try to be flexible since the world is not yet as normalized as we would like it to be. Same thing when we were discussing the value system for the elements. Uh, it's difficult to decide whether an element should be a free text or a controlled vocabulary. So we're trying to balance between the three. And I'm saying the three because we have free text, we have closed vocabularies uh, where possible, but we also allow for open vocabularies. And uh, the way we have implemented open vocabularies is simply by having a value adder. Um, so, uh, so for instance, uh, an open vocabulary is uh, is used when we want to control the values that are input by the user so that we know that they're using the correct values, but also as an instigator to uh, move them towards uh, creating similar, towards using similar values. So for instance, MIME type is implemented in the schema as an open vocabulary. If we said to, if we allowed it this as a free text input with just um, a link to the YANA vocabulary, we've seen that the resource provided will simply say plain text, XML, without looking at the way these are encoded in, in IANA. So this is the way we have implemented it in, um, in MTD share, but we're not happy with it. Uh, we would like, okay, with other, you could have also another element, another field where the user can put their own values. But um, if, but we would like also to be able to curate these values from time to time to check them and see if they should also be standardized in the same, uh, together with the, the other uh, values of the vocabulary. So trying to create an open vocabulary that, but a curated open vocabulary. Finally, as I said before, we need to, we would like to enrich uh, the resource output, the, the output resource of a, of a software component or a software workflow with the processing information because this can be used again as input to the next step, and this is done through a set of elements 
that describe annotation, the software components that have been used, the type of annotation that has been produced, taxes, annotation resources, annotators if there has been some manual annotation as well, format, etc. Anything that covers provenance requirements and anything that can be used as input for further processing. These are the basic principles that we have used for the OMTD share schema. So where are we now? We have a version 1.0.0 and uh, this is documented at this link, you can see it. Uh, we are trying to create user-friendly guidelines, these are on the way. The documentation that we have now is automatically generated and uh, because it's from an XSD it's not very user-friendly but it's uh, it gives more and more information and we're also currently trying to populate the open minted registry with uh, metadata records that have been converted from existing descriptors. This is ongoing work and we expect to get feedback, get inputs that might uh, lead us to changes, hopefully not too many, in the next version of the schema and the registry. Some inputs that we have taken from this uh, endeavor, from these tests in the registry population. First of all, from the publications, Open Air and Core are creating uh, the, um, the APIs that will be used for the user queries when selecting publications to create corpora. Um, the feedback that we get is that uh, there's a lot of other information that we consider important for TDM which is not there. So for instance license, direct link to the publication contents, this is not always found in the publications that OpenAir has aggregated, subject classification is, all, is almost never there, mainly keywords, pretext keywords. Um, and uh, from the content connector that uh, a uh, core that uh, the Open University is uh, creating to extract resources, publications from traditional publishers of scientific content. Uh, we have also reported, uh, we have um, also similar problems reported. There's a lack of a common API approach. Uh, for instance, OAI, nothing like the OAI PMH, which is the established. Uh, uh, protocol, harvesting protocol used across repositories. Um, traditional publishers have different mechanisms for flagging open access content. Um, there's a lack of uh, information about uh, the licensing, legal issues uh, for uh, these um, uh, publications. As I said before, there is inconsistent provision of full text links even in the cross-ref uh, TDM API. Uh, there are problems uh, both legal and technical around the systematic full text aggregation from publishers. It's not easy to aggregate them. There are limits put in place on publisher endpoints, either time or uh, or size uh, constraints, how many publications can be downloaded, for instance. Um, lack of support for discovery of new content that has been uh, entered in the publisher sites or lack of documentation in the publisher systems. Information that comes from the conversion of uh, component descriptors from GER, UEMA and MAVEN. Uh, these descriptors mainly contain Okay, for obvious reasons, uh, largely technical information and even in cases where non-technical information can be uh, recorded in these descriptors, for instance, the development information in Maven, who has developed it, uh, it's seldom used. And this is information, as I said, that, okay, developer information may not be that important for TDM but it's important for citing, it's important for attributing, and it's important as a contact uh, point. Technical elements may be present, but we see that they're not 
always standardized, not always restricted, so media type and language, you can find them as free texts, and it's not always easy to standardize them in the, uh, through a conversion process. Um, we also see a different view of persistent identifier uh, in components as compared with the world of publications from publishers. In Maven, for instance, there's, uh, the, the identifier is self-assigned and no global uniqueness is enforced. Yet it is covered by best practices. But is this something which we can accept, relying on this best practice, or should we enforce something the way publishers do with DOI? Uh, conversion problems that have also been uh, reported uh, from the conversion of metadata records from MetaShare. This is uh, the closest to the OMTD share schema. For obvious reasons, uh, OMTD share has been based in principle to on MetaShare for data sets for corporate components. Yet we have found problems mainly because in OMTD share we have um, we have restricted even more uh, certain elements. We have used more controlled vocabularies, more authority lists. So where something was a free text, we have to find ways of map mapping them to the controlled uh, vocabulary values. And uh, one major also problem has to do with the models, which were not described very well in MetaShare. And this is quite, I think, also interesting. People have described them either as language descriptions, but also as software. Uh, this shows how close models to software developers are to software components rather than uh, data resources. Okay, and uh, with this slide, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for attending it.